So if Dr. Lynch and Dr. Lynn and Dr. McCormick would come up, they're gonna lead off the first session with um, their, their clinical management for FA. And we're doing it a little different this year. In the past, um, each of them have kind of given a presentation um, to help understand the disease a little bit better. This year, we're gonna do it in the form of frequently asked questions that come to our clinicians um, in the clinic. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lynch. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Jen. I'll echo Jen's thoughts on the need for ongoing research and to have people keep participating. I know many of you have asked about coming to see uh, or participate in some of the projects being ongoing at CHOP. Uh, the best way to get enrolled is not necessarily to come up to the podium and speak to me or Kim or Shaner. It's to talk to one of our coordinators who Kim and Shana's coordinators are sitting at that table over there. And could you stand up, please? And my coordinators are for the most part in the back in the corner looking to escape to the coffee if they need it so that they could keep up their energy level to match mine. <laughs> so stand up, ladies and men. So please go talk to them. Don't ask us. <laughs> so yes, we are doing this as frequently asked questions or FAQs. Let's try and get this to go. Okay, is it going for? Uh, yeah, as FAQs, or as I will call them, FAQAs or something like that. Uh, but for, for starting, the, the question I had for myself this morning is a frequently asked question is, what do I ask every day? What am I going to wear? So last night, uh, in spite of yesterday's presentation from Kyle, people were still calling me Dr. Lynch. Please, it's Dave, not David, Dave. David is what my parents call me. Uh, so people still weren't uh, following that. So Jen suggested, well, it's because you don't have your shirt on. So we'll thank Kyle for this lovely riding jersey that you had specially prepared for me yesterday. I want to see if I can slip it over here, which says, uh, just call me Dave in the upper corner. So if you don't know what to call me, just read the shirt. It fits with their your outfits as well, doesn't it? So back to real stuff. Uh, F.A. is, I think. <laughs> F.A., as you know, is a multi-system disorder. Uh, which requires multidisciplinary care. That's the reason we can justify having the three of us up here. Uh, the key features, ataxia, loss of balance, loss of coordination, fatigue, not feeling able to do things because your muscles are tired or because you yourself are simply tired, impaired speech, vision, and hearing, which include both the incoming components to the nervous system, as well as the outgoing components to the nervous system, each of those aspects. Scoliosis, curvature in the spine, which can go for, be from being zero or trivial, all the way to quite severe, requiring hours long surgery. Heart disease, which in itself, if I wish to list the forms, could take the next hour and 15 minutes, so I won't. And diabetes and other endocrine aspects, uh, which at a subclinical level affect uh, certainly a majority of individuals. We have one picture here at the bottom. Let's see if I can get it there. This is a spinal cord uh, from an individual, normal on the right, and a person with FA age four on the left. The thing to notice in this slide, purple, as in those dark blue purple is good it's staining all the axon tracks which are there i think it's actually a milestone uh but you notice in this four-year-old this back port which we call the dorsal column which carries the sensory information is really pale it's almost entirely gone gone to that asymptomatic four-year-old that's to remind so this slide is here to remind us of one other thing that while we talk about these things occurring they're occurring over time, and many of them are occurring quite early before we ever meet people. This That actually was uh, from a person who was entirely asymptomatic. So not only do we have a diverse set, but we have a diverse period of time, which you have to consider when you're thinking about clinical management. So at this point, we'll go to the individual question. So what abnormalities are seen in F.A. Heart? Kim, why don't you take that one? Hello. All right. Perfect. You, you want me to go up here? Oh, you can stay there. 
Can I advance the slide? Oh, you can. I mean, I could do it from memory. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim. You can just call me Kim if you like. I'm a pediatric cardiologist. Um, so, you know, folks who are new to the FA community do ask, like, what are what are the heart abnormalities that can be seen in infratric ataxia? Um, so, it is true that heart involvement is eventually seen in almost everybody with FA. There are some folks who are, you know, unusual outliers um, in whom we don't find a cardiac abnormality all the way through, but most people have some degree of heart involvement. Most commonly, that's a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or extra thickness of the heart muscle. And that can involve thickness that goes all the way around. You'll hear doctors use nice long terms like concentric hypertrophy. We like to sound very smart, but really that means thick all the way around. Um, and sometimes that's asymmetric, meaning some parts of the heart are thicker than others. This thickened heart can progress to a form of heart muscle um, abnormality called dilated cardiomyopathy. That's typically later in the um, course of the condition uh, where the where the heart actually thins out and gets bigger and doesn't squeeze as well. Um, that's unusual for folks who are young. Um, and sometimes when they present young with that, it does get better. Uh, and then finally, the other important uh, manifestation is heart rhythm problems. Again, we like big fancy terms in medicine, so we call it arrhythmias. Um, and for folks with FA, um, in contrast to other folks who have this condition, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, where the abnormal heart rhythms often come from the bottom chamber, folks with FA more commonly have abnormal heart rhythms that come from the top chamber. That can be chronic, that can be very bothersome, that can cause symptoms. It's not typically, at least um, early on, life-threatening, but it's something that comes on insidiously uh, and can be treated. So it's important to recognize it and important to track it over time. So thickened heart muscle, eventually folks can develop a dilated um, uh, cardiomyopathy later in, the, later in the disease course, and then abnormal heart rhythms, especially from the top chamber or the atria. All right. Next question. Next. Next question. I can pick it up on hers. How will my FA progress? And when will I lose the ability to walk? So quite significant questions. Uh, people do progress over time, usually in ambulation and lug function first, followed by arms in most individuals and potentially later in speech and other central nervous system issues such as uh, vision. Legs are usually first, and the milestone within loss of function of the legs that we can is easy to attach oneself is the loss of the ability to ambulate. So that actually has a variety of different meanings, and not everyone will change in the same way. Not everyone will have all the same interim steps. In a typical course, what will people start doing first? The wall walking, uh, couch surfing, a variety of terms where a person, because of the loss of sensory information, which is probably uh, happens before the disease as well as the cerebellar issues, they need to touch the wall, touch someone, hold a cane, not even necessarily even touch it to ground to know better where their limbs are positioned in space, which can restore enough balance to be able to continue walking. So they're barely using that cane. They're not holding the wall. They're simply touching it. After that time, things may progress further to where people are using some sort of a specific mobility device for uh, more substantial support, cane or a walker. And we differentiate the two. Uh, many people skip the cane phase and go directly to a walker. It's sort of a matter of uh, preference, what allows a person to, uh, to do better and to some extent uh, their social supports. After that, people will eventually, if untreated and in the absence of any therapy, which is a contrary to fact condition in the modern uh, world we know, move to wheelchair use, uh, but be able to stand. And that standing is quite important because Shannon will talk about bone health later. We have met the, uh, some individuals with FA whose bones are thin at presentation. So before they've even had any difficulty standing and you must maintain your bone health to do well long-term. And then finally, it'll go on to full-time wheelchair use where a person has extreme difficulty or perhaps even inability to transfer. And one of the aspects of that is how will you progress? There's a simple phrase. As we noted here, people who, if I point in here, does it come up on the screen? No. Uh, if you look at people of different ages and when we meet them, 
This is the earliest onset, later, later still. You walk, you lose the ability to walk at this 50 percentile level later and later, depending on you present. And it's not only because of where you showed up, but it's also because actually you can get the feel that it's the slope of the curve. Another way of say, saying this all together is typically that the more you progress, the more uh, rapidly you progress, the, the more you are affected, the more rapidly you are likely to progress. The best indicator of how you will do is how you've done. The, the federal government spent a lot of money sending me to medical school to learn important statements like that. Uh, I think you could have told me that, but it actually is very true. The best predictor of how you will do is how you have done. Uh, again, your tax dollars at work. Uh, but progression is part of this, and going through the stages and learning how to uh, augment abilities each time is a very important thing of clinical man aspect of clinical management. I get this one too. I get to do two in a row. Uh, should we have our other children tested for FA? And on the other questions, there might even be a yes or no answer. On this one, I don't think there's a yes or no answer. Remember, this one is everyone's own decision based on their lives and what's important to them and how they might best manage it. I will also note that the answer to this question is evolving over time, both within the field, within the disease, and within anyone's individual life based on what uh, important questions are. So basic genetics again. Friedrich ataxia is what we call an autosomal recessive or recessive disease. Uh, each parent is a carrier. NFA, carriers have no symptoms. Based on work by Sanjay Bidi Chandani, I just love saying that name, uh, it is highly unlikely that a carrier can even manifest based on their most recent, any aspect of the disease. It just won't work uh, as we understand it now. Carriers are entirely normal and don't show any feature of the disease, but a child with a one out of four chance uh, will have inherited both uh, mutated genes, FX, mutated FXN genes, and thus be affected with FA. Uh, in that situation, when you know one of your children is affected, should you test the other siblings? Uh, note, of course, that the original slide said children, and remember if a sibling is older than 18, it's of course their decision to choose. I don't make light of that because in fact, week before last, it was a question two weeks ago of unaffected, potentially affected 30 year olds and individuals who were presented slightly earlier. Uh, so the siblings can present it any time later. And this becomes important because the, the world has changed a little bit in this question with the uh, discover, with the marketing of OMAV and the ability of a uh, treatment for those asymptomatic or marginally symptomatic 30 year olds. So you can test at risk children. The old uh, dogma would have been you don't do it. But I think there has to be a much more rational perspective where you think about it. Uh, if there's a treatment, now OMAV is a treatment for people 16 and older. Uh, there is no pharmacological therapy for under 16, but define what a treatment is. Is coenzyme Q a treatment? I think most of us think that it might be uh, beneficial. Is prevention of presenting with heart disease by screening EKGs and echoes a treatment? It could be argued that it is. And then even beyond that, beyond the medical, uh, world, you have to consider about management of other life issues, uh, financial planning, uh, things like that. So I think we have to take a more liberal approach to when in a reasonable scenario is for testing at-risk individuals. And in addition, now with the advent of a therapy, you have to consider other branches of the family, which you would have waited until presentation before, before thinking about now with the possibility of treating people who are uh, over 16, you have to start considering looking at other branches of the family if it's relevant. Who do you go to see this? Genetic counselors. Uh, they can help take care of it. We're also happy to do it. Remember, I do employ a genetic counselor on my staff right now, Mackenzie, so you can ask questions of her this afternoon or later in the morning if you like. Again, that's diverting attention away from me. Uh, so it's important to have good people working for you. So that is a, something which to consider is that we could talk more about testing at-risk individuals these days. Now, remember, if you do test at-risk individuals, there's no going back. Think about it before you do it and have a good rationale. But I think that's a reasonable standard in the present world. I'm sure I'll have questions about that. And the freely asked, freely uh, fact with part later. Can I, can I 
Kim would like to interject. So hi again, Kim, your friend, a cardiologist. Um, you know, genetic testing for other children before seeing any symptoms is a, is a very personal decision. Um, so everybody's going to make a different decision based on their own personal circumstances. If if you don't know yet if you want to, but you're worried about some of the things that might come up. So for example, heart disease could be a part of FA. One, one thing you could do is just ask for clinical screening for those things if you're not ready to do the genetic testing. And then vice versa, if genetic testing is right for you, then that can help know what you need to get screened for or not. So there are lots of different ways to approach this. And again, it's a very personal decision. And the other one aspect is people are worried, uh, this doesn't apply to symptomatic individuals, people who have an issue. If a person has an issue, you need to explain it. And the, what if it's not FA and it's something readily treatable that does occur on occasion, then you do not want to miss that. So people who are symptom, children who are symptomatic get tested for whatever is relevant in order to prevent future disease of any type. Is there pain in free brachytaxia? Now that, that initial review of the symptoms of FA didn't include pain. That's a good question why we don't include it. People have higher scores on uh, quality of life pain scales. So there certainly is pain in FA. Where does it come from? Well, it can come from just about every system. Uh, Kim will talk a little bit about chest pain and chest pain ascribable to the heart, but it also comes from other, ways, other aspects. The complications of scoliosis, uh, the complications of surgical intervention as well. I would say that people with FA probably take a little bit longer for their scars to heal from a pain perspective, although that's not conclusively doc documented, uh, and various other types of pain. But the most common one we see is so-called, quote, neuropathic pain from loss of the sensory information. Remember, just because you are numb in an area doesn't mean you can't feel pain. The brain can interpret the absence of signals as pain. If this is, it typically is burning, it is typically in the most distal parts of uh, a limb, the bottom of one's feet, it can move up uh, to some degree, but it's usually burning pain in the feet is how it's described. This is treatable symptomatically. Two common agents, gabapentin and Lyricure, they both are actually approved for this, I believe. They have their share of side effects like sleepiness, sleepiness, and sleepiness. Uh, but they can be effective, and we can usually find a dose which is beneficial. I did not say perfect. I said beneficial. So again, it's like any symptomatic therapy. You take what you need to feel better at the risk of whatever side effects might occur. And there are some people who get lots of side effects and some who get none. Yours. Dave's off the hook for a moment here. How often should I see a cardiologist? And what should I expect at each visit? Well, if you have a diagnosis of Friedrich ataxia, you should get screened at least as soon as soon as is reasonably possible, um, even if not having any symptoms, just to know at baseline how do things look, right? And after that, um, I think there's going to be some reference to the new clinical management guidelines that are available online. Those guidelines do recommend annual screening, so once a year with cardiology. Um, that may end up varying um, depending on how your, your condition is personally progressing or not and what your cardiologist says, but a good, a good basis of you know, regularity would be at least once a year. So when you go see the cardiologist, what's that going to entail? In general, there's, it's a little bit lengthy because there's a little bit of testing involved, right? Um, so there's going to be some sort of pictures of your heart taken. And usually that's an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of your heart. Um, that's cold gel on your chest using Doppler technology to look at the heart. There are no needles with that. It shouldn't hurt. Um, the other way to look at your heart would be a cardiac MRI. That's a little bit more involved. Um, most sensors don't have 10 cardiac MRIs running all the time. So there's often some scheduling involved with that. Um, and then actually getting an MRI of the heart because your heart's a moving structure takes a little bit of time. Um, they'll have you lying on a nice, comfortable-ish, flat table in a roomy-ish, kind of tight, somewhat claustrophobia-inducing tube. Um, they take really nice pictures, though, and people like me love looking at those pictures. Um, it can give us a nice sense of how well your heart is squeezing, 
um, how thick your heart muscle is. Uh, and then also it can give us a sense of whether there's any um, in the tissue, like evidence of fibrosis or what we call scar tissue on the heart, which we can't see by an ultrasound. So your cardiologist may ask for that, hopefully not super often. Um, the test itself shouldn't hurt, except again, if you're claustrophobic or don't like tight spaces. Um, and then most folks um, for this type of an MRI will ask for an IV to be placed so we can use a certain um, type of uh, contrast called gadolinium-based um, contrast. So that those are the two types of imaging you might get asked to do when you see your cardiologist, either before or on the day of the visit. Second, a cardiologist will want to see what your heart rhythm is doing. And usually that's a quick screening, a little, you know, squiggly line EKG. Um, that is a six second snapshot of what your heart rhythm is doing. Uh, but then there's also a longer term monitor, which many of us will recommend at least periodically to screen what your heart rhythms do over a longer period of time. And the technology for looking your heart rhythm um, over a longer period of time has evolved. Yay. Um, you don't have to carry a big pack on your back to record your rhythm. It's usually actually a patch that contains all it needs to record your rhythm right within the patch on your chest. Uh, and those can now be worn for anywhere from 24 hours to 14 days, um, the patches, and they're temporary. They can even get wet uh, if necessary uh, and not hurt you. Um, and then there are also implantable loop recorders for folks who are having either frequent symptoms and we're trying to figure out if your heart rhythm is causing like heart racing episodes or um, funny feelings in your chest. Uh, and, and those can be implanted and those last for about three years at a time. So those are the, uh, the types of longer term heart rhythm monitors that a cardiologist will discuss with you. Third, a cardiologist may want to get a functional assessment of how your heart does when you're doing things. Uh, and so we usually do exercise stress tests for that assessment. That's not necessarily an every visit thing and actually not always feasible depending on the office that you go to. They may not have the equipment for exercise stress tests and you may or may not be able to use the equipment that they have. So for example, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we typically had a, a treadmill, a standing treadmill for exercise stress tests or a, a tall upright cycle that you'd have to pedal. Uh, we have acquired with the help of of Farah and some sponsors, a recumbent cycle to be able to do an exercise stress test on some folks who can, you know, sit in a reclined position. And we also have um, some places have an arm ergometer that can have you moving um, and measure, you know, how your heart rhythm does and how your heart performs during that type of a test. And finally, there may be some laboratory studies that are asked, so blood. Um, and the, the two types of tests that cardiologists most frequently ask for are troponin and uh, BNP, which we can talk about in a little bit. And here I just have a few pictures uh, of how the heart looks, except they're still frames, and I don't think they're automatically playing. But uh, if you come to your cardiologist, we'll show you pictures if you want to see pictures. Hey, do you see your own if you go to the cardiologist where they bring that up for you? Well, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if you're pregnant and go for your ultrasound, it's hard to hide the pictures from the person if you want to look at them. So. <laughs> but yes, you can ask for an explanation also. Okay. Very good. That works. So, Shana, you do sugar stuff. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, I do do sugar stuff. Thanks, everyone, for... Um, for including me in this discussion. So this question, how should blood sugar be monitored in Friedrich ataxia is a really important one to me. Um, as Dave mentioned, even though maybe 10 to 20%, we suspect if folks may ultimately develop what counts in the textbook as diabetes, a lot more folks have some abnormal blood sugars. Um, that may be more or less apparent at different points in their lives, including, for example, when they're sick, sick enough to be hospitalized. Um, the reason it's really important to me as an endocrinologist is because we have medicines to address and treat abnormal blood sugars, and we think we can keep people healthier for the long term from a neurologic standpoint, from a cardiac standpoint, with respect to fatigue, with respect to energy, by optimizing those blood sugars. Um, and as diabetologists, we have more and more medicines to treat abnormal blood sugars that we think we can thoughtfully use in folks with FA. So we shouldn't miss the opportunity to identify abnormal blood sugars and treat them if we need to. Um, so how do we do that? First, we advance this slide, right? So 
Um, when I get asked about Friedrich's related diabetes, that's the ter the term I use. So one question, I don't think it made it into the FACWA, Dave, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Is is Friedrich's related diabetes type one or type two? So this question kind of builds on overall some confusion that people have about different kinds of diabetes that exist. So the diabetes 101 version for folks with Friedrichs and for kind of all of us, type one diabetes, what we think of as type one, used to be called childhood onset um, because we thought only children could get it. What it really means is that the immune system, for reasons we don't understand, attacks the pancreas so it can't make insulin. Insulin is that hormone that controls blood sugar. Turns out kids and adults can get autoimmune forms of diabetes. From what we know with people in Friedrichs, including children, um, autoimmunity is, doesn't seem to be a part of that kind of diabetes. What can be true in particular in children and what's true in adults as well is there's more of a need for insulin. So when we think of type 2 diabetes, many people learn, oh, type 2, that's the one where, where you just take like oral medicines and you don't need insulin. Well, it turns out that's not true either, right? So type 2 diabetes we think of as more being affected by things like excess weight gain and habits, um, which are true, but some folks end up needing insulin um, and some folks end up benefiting from other medicines. So I think of Friedrichs as its own form of diabetes. As an endocrine doctor, we know that the pancreas, the cells that make insulin are more vulnerable than they, than they seem to be in other people. So that's one um, management piece that that when I talk to other endocrinologists who take care of folks with Friedrichs that I make them alert to, that people may need insulin um, sooner than they might think uh, out in the general population. I do think many people with Friedrichs are candidates for other medicines and that's individualized. So really important to look at that newly uh, expanding menu of available drugs and see what might be right if blood sugar is abnormal. Um, so how do we screen? Um, First, we, we educate you, so you, this is your participating here, that diabetes can present um, in folks with, um, with FA and a change from baseline, especially um, drinking more than usual, being more thirsty than usual. Those are symptoms suggestive of high blood sugars, but really any change from someone's usual diabetes should be on the list of, of factors to, to think of because it can be easily checked off, right? We check up fasting blood sugar, and a hemoglobin A1C, that's a measurement that gives us a sense of average blood sugar over three months um, and get a reasonable sense of someone's blood sugar levels. Um, in the laboratory setting, we do something called glucose tolerance tests. Uh, many folks may be familiar if they during their pregnancies, if they remember having those where they you drink a sugar drink and we, we measure blood sugar and insulin. Um, we tend to do that less in clinical practice now because it's really easy to do two things. One, to hand a blood sugar meter to someone and say, hey, just check a few blood sugars at home and see what they are. The other thing we sometimes do is put on a, a continuous glucose monitor, little patch, um, usually the size of a silver dollar that can measure blood sugar continuously for a week or two and feed that information back. So we get a rich um, set of information about our patients and, um, and kind of identify patterns that, that might prompt us to treat them. Um, there's a point there, screening with hemoglobin A1C alone can miss individuals with acute onset diabetes. So if you look at Hemoglobin A1C can be normal in someone whose blood sugars are really acutely abnormal. So then thinking of measuring blood sugars and ketones, which is another important indicator of um, glucose status, can really help um, identify the right treatment. Sure. Sure. So the next question is about a neurological symptom, stiff legs. It's not what you think of with ataxia, but over the course of time, many people with FA will notice that their legs are no longer so weak, but they're more stiff as well as having an underlying weakness. What's going on there? Well, there is what we talk about FA as an ataxia, but in fact, other regions of the brain are involved in a particular region, which this is not on a quiz called the cortical spinal tract, which tends to become affected with time. And actually, I think later on, it may be even more, more affected than the part we call the cerebellum. 
So you see the stiff, stiffness, which we have a particular name called spasticity, evolve, much more common in legs than in arms. It again is treatable. It's the treatment is either baclofen or Xanaflex or less commonly dantrolene or amantadine. Uh, they, they have more issues, major issues, sleepiness. Well, do you want to get rid of those stiff legs? That's an interesting question because you, people can use that stiffness to their advantage. They can use it to stand in some cases when they might not have had the strength or balance to stand without that. So it's very common in multiple sclerosis to give someone baclofen for their stiffness and they come back saying, my stiffness in great shape now, but I can't stand anymore. I can't walk anymore. So we made the stiffness better, but didn't help anyone. It is a judgment call. So how much a person needs? Ask the questions of your neurologist or physician What uh, and ask yourself, what is the goal? Do you want to use a decrease in stiffness to transfer better? Do you want to use it so that you walk a little better? and understand what the issues might be arise by going too far. Now, if you go too far, yes, decrease the medicine and you go right back where you were. These are symptomatic medicines. There are no permanent uh, effects of them. Uh, and you have to keep te taking them to keep the benefit on. I'll note over time, the brain tends to uh, become tolerant to both baclofen and Xanaflex. So you see that the dose that you need slowly increases evidence of uh, uh, molecular mechanisms as well as the fact the disease is changing but realize this is a treatable thing and you should always ask about does fa impact vision is there anything you do to improve or protect vision i think most people know for a variety of reasons this is one of the things i talk a lot about the answer is yes if you look at the old textbooks it will be mentioned that 86 percent of individuals with fa have subtle abnormalities as detected in lab tests. That doesn't tell you anything about practical life. Uh, there are several different types of vision problems in FS. First, if your eyes are not working together, they will be slightly misaligned. And you might have subtle double vision, which you will interpret as simply blurred vision. There's a way to figure out if that's going on. Cover one eye. If it gets better, the issue you have is from your two eyes being misaligned. And there, you look what, uh, it could be a side effect of medicines, it could be a variety of different things, but that's where you start. So I think most people will remember, that's the first question I ask anyone with vision loss. Close one eye and see what happens. I will note, if you're, let's say, 40 years old or so, and you're having more trouble, particularly from misalignment of the eyes, it's probably just presbyopia, which I hate to say is not a feature of FA, it's a feature of getting older. So, uh, so we will all need reading glasses, although at least one person on the panel up here is too vain to wear reading glasses. They don't match his shirt. Uh, so you, and that actually sort of emphasizes the second type of vision problem in FA. Other things that are entirely unrelated to FA, but being misascribed to them. So after you do the test of closing one eye, the first thing is going to be to see an eye doctor, ophthalmologist, or optometrist to see if a person needs a new refraction, uh, has something else going on, or the other possibility if a person is a known diabetic or closet diabetic where they're having direct effects of diabetes on their eyes. Uh, I can say I've seen that once or twice in FA where people have acute vision loss from the diabetes. So the second step after checking whether it's one eye or both eyes is, of course, to see an ophthalmologist and see what they find out. And then after that, it becomes intrinsic parts of FA. Now, people with FA do not lose what we call high contrast vision, reading black letters on a white background until relatively late. That's because the pattern of vision loss in each eye causes other things to be affected first. Contrast, as we see on this particular picture here, gray letters on a white background. For the record, CDN's ZSV, is that a KCH, the ODK maybe? And then I got, I know there are letters on the next line. These are meant to be really tough and that's why I use the joke, uh, some of the letters that I can't see but people with FA do lose this early. Now, is that a vision 
does that affect you in real life? Well, it probably does because most of the world is not black on white. That's not meant to be a philosophical statement. It's made to be a directory of vision statement. The world is gray letters on white background, so you may not even know it's affecting your vision. And then later, the loss of black letters on a uh, uh, white background will appear. Yes, some people can progress to near total blindness or... Uh, and uh, until one gets quite late, is all may have potential treatments. And that's why we have clinical trials specifically directed at vision. Vision loss is more likely to occur for people with worse genetic disease, longer GA repeats or point mutations, a younger age of onset, and it happens as people worsen. So while a person may present between five and 10 without intervention, they may be destined to get vision loss between 25 and 35. Uh, we're trying to learn more about who is destined to have this so that we might intervene earlier. Another bad symptom, chest pain. Dave can answer this because he probably gets this question a lot. Yes. <laughs> but I'll take it. Actually, I'm curious. For those of you in the room, I can't see those of you online, but if you're in the room, if you or your loved one who has FA has either currently or in the past had to deal with chest pain. Would you mind raising your hand? I'm just curious how, wow, okay, yep. Yeah, so um, pretty common, not universal, but pretty common. Um, the, the main point I wanted to get across with this one is just that chest pain does not mean that you're having a traditional heart attack. Um, but <laughs> the question was, what does it mean? And the answer is very, again, individualized and often I don't know for sure. Um, I do think that chest pain is a common enough problem in, pe in people with FA who have heart manifestations that are evident um, that I do believe that in many cases, not all, that it is probably related to the heart disease in FA, even if it's not a, a typical traditional heart attack. Um, so in that respect, it's also not intervenable um, or immediately life-threatening in the way that a heart attack would be, but still it can be very profound in terms of its effect on somebody's quality of life and how they're feeling and how they're able to go about their daily life. So it's a real problem. It's one we want to make better. Um, we think that for those who have chest pain that might be related to their heart, even if it's not a heart attack, that it's probably related to imbalance between how much oxygen the heart wants and how much it's getting, so supply and demand. So there are probably, especially in the cases where the heart muscle is extra thick, there may be areas of the heart muscle that don't get the oxygen supply all the way through the muscle like it should. Um, there may, even if the large coronary arteries, those blood vessels that are feeding oxygen to the heart muscle, even if the big ones aren't occluded, there may be smaller ones that have like a mild amount of disease and that may also cause pain. Um, and then also if the heart muscle's thick, it may not be able to relax as well. And so the heart the heart gets its oxygen perfusion when the heart's relaxing. And if it doesn't relax as well, that may also cause a, a mismatch between the supply of oxygen and the, and the demand that the heart muscle has. Um, that being said, um, big heart muscle disease, coronary artery disease is really not commonly seen in FA. It doesn't mean that if you have FA, you can't have a heart attack. It's just not a likely thing if you don't have other risk factors, right? So if you are say 55 and have FA and have a strong family history of early coronary artery disease and you've been smoking all your life and uh, so you have risk factors, then chest pain all of a sudden radiating down my left arm up to the jaw, like please get to an emergency room, right? Because it could be a heart attack. Um, but 21 years old and has Friedrich ataxia and not a strong family history and has, you know, chest pain, your doctor should be asking more questions, right? Is it related to time of day? Um, is it related to any other symptoms like nausea or eating certain types of food? Do you have asthma? Are there other potential causes? And then if it really seems like we've knocked down those other causes, but you're still having pain that's limiting quality and ability to do the things that you want to do, there may be some medicines to try that decrease the demand that your heart muscle has um, for that oxygen supply. So things like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, there are pros and cons to those things. But again, if you're having chest pain, think about potential other causes with your doctor and then there may be there may be treatments um, for heart related chest pain that's not coronary artery disease. Okay. 
oh, the next one's me too. <laughs> How should someone's heart who has FA be managed if you're going into surgery? And again, I'm going to give a shout out to the new clinical management guidelines that were published in the past year, because they actually have a whole section about surgical considerations, because you may hear me answer this question now and then forget you know, in six months or 12 months or three years, if you're facing a surgery. So know that there's a reference for this. Um, but there's an increased rec recognition within the FA community that some types of surgery, um, in particular spinal fusion surgery, which is a long, um, typically long surgery with a lot of potential fluid shifts, um, can be can be higher risk in folks who have phrygic ataxia. And we think this may be for several reasons. Um, again, fluid shifts and potentially blood loss can cause poorly tolerated alterations in how much blood the heart is getting back. Again, we like to use fancy terms in cardiology. So we talk about ventricular preload being low. We just wanna make sure there's enough um, gas in the tank to keep pumping around, right? Um, low blood sugar, low blood pressure, and also stress may contribute to metabolic decompensation in folks at risk for metabolic decompensation. So we talk about mitochondrial conditions um, having these risks, and there's a mitochondrial component at least to Friedrich ataxia. So these may be vulnerable time points for someone with FA, especially with respect to their heart, which uses a lot of energy and needs to have a lot of energy supply to stay stable. Um, Potentially, the risks to the heart with a with a high risk surgery include congestive heart failure um, and also heart rhythm problems. But I do want to give the message that with close surveillance, surgery can go smoothly. Okay, so if you need surgery and you have FA, FA doesn't mean that you can't have the surgery. Okay, um, I would recommend you know making sure that your cardiologist has seen you in the relatively recent past and can give recommendations to your surgical team, not only the surgeon herself or himself, but also the anesthesia team taking care of you during the case, before the case, and then the recovery team looking after you when you're done with the surgery. Um, for some of these higher risk surgeries like spinal fusion surgeries, we've actually recommended a special echocardiogram that's performed or available during the surgery. Um, this in involves actually a camera that's put down the esophagus, so your feeding tube, so that they can take pictures of your heart from behind your heart and know whether your heart's squeeze and preload still looks good while you're going through the surgery. And they don't need somebody to come in and perform the echocardiogram on top of your chest while you're flipped over for a spinal fusion and they can't get to your chest and can't look at your heart that way. Having the probe, the camera in place at the start of the surgery allows us to be able to look at the heart throughout the whole thing whenever we want to. And then second, just make sure you're, that your team is aware that they should pay attention both to your heart rhythm and your volume status, whether you've gotten a lot of fluid in or lost a lot of fluid because the surgery took a long time. Um, so that's before, during, and after the surgical case. So a lot of attention to detail, but you can get through surgery smoothly and safely. Oh my goodness. You again. Me again. You're stuck with me again. All right. So what should I tell my doctors about my heart if I present to the ER? And this is probably most relevant to the two questions ago, right? Bottom line here is really know your baseline and be your best advocate, right? So People with FA will often have abnormalities at baseline, especially with, relate, uh, with respect to how your heart looks on standard tests, right? So with that in mind, if you present to an emergency room and you don't know, and the, the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the PA meeting you doesn't know what your baseline is, then anything they get that can reflect how your heart look, is doing may look really abnormal and they won't know how to interpret that right? So ask your cardiologist for baseline studies when you're feeling well, when you're not having chest pain and you're doing fine, that's actually important information because you may have abnormalities on your baseline EKG. You may have an elevated troponin level compared to a person who doesn't have FA or doesn't have another heart condition. So knowing whether your troponin is a little bit high compared to a normal person or your EKG is abnormal compared to a normal person the same age as you is important for comparison's sake, right? And you can keep that. Many people have um, uh, medical applications that, that keep information like at, like at your smartphone. 
or you can ask to take pictures or take a paper copy of your EKG. Um, there used to be um, jump drives, right, that people would store their medical information on. But given the advent of medical charts that people can access, um, those are probably less common now. But find a way to keep your baseline uh, information with you so that you can know that and you can share that with folks who are going to meet you who either don't know anything about FA or just really don't know anything about you before you're meeting them in an emergency situation. All right, so that's that's what I got. Ah, Sheena. Thank you. So this next question, does uh, Friedrich's ataxia affect growth and puberty? I'm going to show you um, a little bit of data in a minute, but before I, I show you what we've learned, I'm going to lead with the takeaway, which is that um, growth is such an important measure of health in all children, right, including children with FA, that it needs to be measured. And that seems like the most obvious statement, right? But one of the findings that from the study that's actually the most compelling finding and, and all the data that I'm going to show you, you need to interpret in context is that a lot of kids don't get measured when they go to the doctor. So we, I wish we could say and at CHOP always are really good about this. Even we have to make it a priority and people will say, oh, this child can't stand independently or this child uses a wheelchair. So that makes it difficult. You're going to be hearing later today about things like gene therapy, about imp I mean, we've already heard about implanted heart rate rhythm monitors. I mean, there are some amazing, amazing things that people can accomplish. We can accomplish safely measuring children, right? And we should. Um, not only is, is growth really important index of health, and if growth is faltering or growth is not normal, we need to look for both Friedrich's related causes and Friedrich's unrelated causes for that, right? Um, you know, Kim may care if her, her patients are gaining weight quickly. That could suggest fluid retention. Like, And for pediatrics, most of the medications that we use are dosed based on size, right? So having accurate measurements, even if perhaps that happens like, you know, once a year in a really focused way um, is really important. Okay, so that's that's my, my soapbox about growth. Um, and then here's a little bit of data that we have, again, from a cohort in whom we suspect that we're not getting a lot of measurements from our most affected individuals. So we're hoping that pattern will change. Um, what, I'll talk about the, the bullet points um, first. First, we found that um, children with Friedrichs are more likely to be underweight and less likely to have overweight or obese uh, obesity compared with the general population, which has been true in my experience. So um, sometimes there needs to be attention paid to, to lack of nutrition in some kids who are very profoundly affected. Um, by the time they're adults, BMI or body mass index, for folks who aren't familiar with that acronym, that's a way of thinking about weight relative to height. It's a tool that was developed for epidemiologic studies, so for large-scale studies. We measure and report body mass index for individuals because it's one piece of information, but it's not the only number that gives a sense of health. Um, uh, we know, unfortunately, that adults with Friedrichs, just like kind of the rest of us, are susceptible to, to gaining weight excessively, um, sometimes from our habits in ways that adversely affect our health. So something to pay attention to. Um, the figure that you see, this is our pointer, the figure that you see here, this is a growth chart, but maybe a different one than you're used to looking at. Um, it still has age on the x-axis. so. Um, from five to 20, but on the y-axis, instead of how tall the child is, this is how fast they are growing, right? So um, what we do statistically, what we model in some of our research is how quickly kids grow. So you can see the two, the two mountains in the center, that's the pubertal growth spurt, um, and girls have their growth spurt earlier than boys. So the two colors show us... Um, a reference cohort, that's the solid line, and a dashed cohort, that's children with Friedrichs. Um, and we found on average, some signals that looked like growth was affected in people with Friedrichs. So in girls, the how quickly they grew during puberty was a bit less, and in boys, the timing was a bit later. Um, as an endocrinologist, it's not surprising to me that growth would be affected. Growth is a, is a 
really energy consuming process. And the way we think about it in clinic is growth is kind of a luxury, right? If the body has enough energy and resources to produce a big growth spurt, it will. But if it doesn't, then that um, that gets sacrificed. So that's an important piece of information to, to follow along. Um, we also found out in adults that folks with more um, disease severity also were a bit shorter. Um, so clinically, how do we use this? If we suspect, and it should be part of every pediatrician's assessment, if we suspect that growth is affected, we think about what are the causes we should look for that span beyond Friedrich ataxia, um, things like thyroid problems or celiac disease, which are common in the general population, and absolutely we shouldn't attribute differences in growth simply to free drinks without looking for some of those other causes. Um, and then there may be conditions specific to free drinks. So is um, a child not growing as well because their scoliosis is worsening? And is that something that needs attention? Or are they gaining weight poorly because their blood sugars are higher and we need to address evolving diabetes? Um, so most important to have it measured and to have it look, have um, height and weight measured and looked at. All right, so we're keeping on the endocrine theme for another couple of slides, I think. Um, this question, should bone health be screened in Friedrich ataxia? So bones, as Dave mentioned, are really important. Um, and bone health is, is something that we study and that's um, our understanding of what to do about how healthy bones are and chronic disease is evolving. So. The reason how strong the bones are and how dense the bones are is important is that bones that are fragile break more easily. And broken bones are really problematic for lots of reasons. So they can cause pain and discomfort and they can get in the way of function. So they can set folks back, you know, who are already potentially having challenges with mobility. So when we look at the um, research, so this first, first I'll orient you, this, um, this uh, image that you see is a person lying flat on a DEXA uh, table. A DEXA scan is how we measure uh, bone density in most individuals. DEXA stands for dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. It's a mouthful. It is X-rays, so, um, uh, it is, there is some amount of what's called ionizing radiation when we do this, um, we do this scan. For folks who may be concerned about that, the amount of ionizing radiation um, from a DEXA scan is around the same as a cross-country flight. So there may be folks who, who experienced around that level to get to this conference. So we think in the, in the appropriate individuals is worth, worth that exposure. Um, so A, B, M, D, you see on this slide, that's aerial bone mineral density. That's what we assess using a DEXA scan. Um, it's common to have low bone density in folks with Friedrichs. Um, the other thing that this slide reminds me to mention to you is that um, we assess bone density, not just on the whole skeleton on average, although we, we can, but we look at different areas differently because some areas can be more vulnerable to fracture and some areas can be more affected, for example, by loss of ambulation, by not walking. The, our bones get stronger um, by, by being loaded by muscles. So like standing and walking, particularly to the weight bearing parts of the skeleton are what make them stronger. So if folks are not walking or not loading those bones, that's when they can um, become more, more, um, more fragile. So we found that lower bone density at the femoral neck, the femoral neck is in the hip, was associated with worse disease in fo folks with Friedrichs. And in one study we did um, in adults, a 30 close to 30% had reported a history of what, what we are calling here potentially pathologic fracture. So um, we, we call this potentially here because this wasn't a bone focused study of the questionnaire that, that we, um, or the, the data that we used. But pathologic fractures are really important in endocrinology. What makes a fracture or a broken bone pathologic is that we wouldn't expect that a healthy individual with healthy bones would have a break from the mechanism of injury. So one example of a pathologic fracture might be a fall um, from standing height that produces a broken bone. Or some people might even present with back pain and have crush in fractures in their vertebra. So their vertebra get shorter because the vertebra are not strong enough to withstand the pressure of the spinal column. Typical healthy bones don't fracture that way. 
in contrast is someone who is in a, a car accident where the airbags deploy right at high velocity and they break a few ribs like we might expect that to happen. So if someone has a broken bone, we try to figure out is that pathologic. So a fair number of adults with Friedrichs report having had a fracture that we suspect could have been pathologic. Um, we've also found this clinically that kids with Friedrichs have um, lower bone density in the areas that we typically examine. And not many people have undergone DEXA scanning. Um, that brings up the important question, who should have this done? And Kim mentioned this, the screening guidelines. We did our best to articulate the current consensus among endocrine doctors, but that consensus continues to evolve based on what treatments are available and the risk benefit balance of that treatment. So to answer the question with what we know today, anyone who has had a fragility fracture, meaning a broken bone where we say, gosh, that seems really surprising that, that your bone would be broken for that reason. Or there are people who show up and they're like, my bone's broken, but I have no idea how I did it. That's considered a fragility fracture. That person should have a DEXA scan to look for fragile bones. We suspect that many people um, several years after primarily using a wheelchair to get around will probably have fragile enough bones that bone density can be assessed, again, because we have medicines that we can use to help prevent future fractures. And newer thinking um, that I think is, is uh, mainly from our colleagues in the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy world, but I think could be relevant to FA is that people who may be within one to two years of losing the ability to ambulate might be an important group to focus on with respect to evaluating bone health. And the reason for that is if, that, if those folks have fragile bones and are candidates for treatment, we might help prevent a fracture that could hasten loss of ambulation, right? So if someone's already struggling to maintain their ambulation, if they fall and break a bone, then they may lose the ability to walk sooner. So those may might be an important group to, to focus on. And that's that's what's happening in Duchenne's right now and may be worth considering in Friedrichs um, also. So good to discuss with your neurologist or your endocrinologist if you see one or your primary care doctor. Am I someone who might benefit from um, a DEXA scan to see if I need specific medication to help with preventing fracture? How many folks here have had a DEXA scan? Okay. Yeah, not many. Not what we expected. Oh, yeah, broken bones. There's a couple. Yeah. I've had a broken bones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so one more for me about like what, you know, what should we be doing about this? Should I be taking vitamin D3? So, you know, we've had a lot of questions where the answer is complex. Maybe yes, maybe no. You should decide. Da, da, da. This is an easy one. So this, yes, <laughs> um, most of us do not get enough vitamin D from our diet or based on where we live longitudinally enough from the sunshine. So getting enough vitamin D is difficult, not just for people with Friedrichs, but in the general population. More and more multivitamins actually have enough vitamin D to sustain a healthy level. Historically, they haven't. That's why even people taking a daily multivitamin often don't have enough um, vitamin D. I should mention for folks who aren't familiar, vitamin D is really important because it helps our bodies absorb calcium. Um, and our bones are made, the white part of our bones are made of calcium and phosphorus. So if you don't have enough vitamin D, you don't absorb the calcium, you don't put the calcium into your bones, there's no way they can be as strong. And this is, again, this is true in folks without FA also. Um, so for my own kids, for my family, um, general rule of thumb, kids under 10, we give them 20 micrograms or 800 IUs of vitamin D3. And folks who are 10 and older, 25 micrograms or 1,000 units of vitamin D3. Um, and we give them enough calcium to meet the RDA, so the recommended daily allowance. And if you look on the nutrition label, you know, you'll, you'll say like this cup of yogurt gets you to 20% or 30%. Well, that 20 or 30% is for adults, um, kids need often 130% of what's like on the nutrition label as a good, as a good metric. If you're having blood drawn, um, or blood drawn for other reasons, the level that we measure is a 25 hydroxy vitamin D. That's the level that reflects how much vitamin D is in the blood. Um, and we tend to target levels 30 to 50 nanograms per ml. So 
um, we can evaluate and we tend to evaluate the adequacy of how well folks are doing on their current vitamin D um, replacement strategy. I'll mention, and just as in passing, um, when we talk about vitamin D and calcium and people will say, oh, I'm sure I eat enough calcium because I saw my blood work and there was a calcium level and it was fine. And so I'm probably okay. Um, we don't usually measure calcium in the blood to assess bone health unless we're evaluating someone for a fragility fracture and we're, we're wondering if their calcium levels are abnormal for that reason. The body defends, keeps the calcium level normal at considerable expense. So even if you're not eating much calcium, what the body will do is take calcium out of your bones to keep the level in your blood normal because it wants to maintain normal heart rhythms, for example, they're really important roles of calcium. So a normal circulating level of calcium in the blood does not reassure us that someone is getting enough. They could be stealing it from their bones. So important to pay attention nutritionally to how much they're getting. Okay, perhaps in some ways, the most important question is depression part of Friedrich Atatia. I think most people would tell us the answer is yes. Yes, depression can be part of FA. In fact, it's more common in essentially all central nervous system diseases. And if you go to Parkinson's disease, which probably has the highest level, it's 40% of Parkinson's patients at any given moment. That's not lifetime prevalence. That's at any given moment. You can think about it as part of the chemical anatomical and structural nature of the disease, almost impossible to divorce from the other findings of it. We see the same issue in FA that 5% of uh, all people with FA, without FA, for example, have a major depression and in their lifetime. So it's one in 20 people in the room who don't right now, who don't have FA, who have a major depression requiring intervention during their lifetime. And FA is clearly much higher. Depression is a, a tough thing to talk about but it's also sometimes tough to define. It is more than simply feeling sad or simply feeling reactively sad in conjunction with events. It's something that is in essence feeling sad when there isn't as much reason in some case. So when you do have a reason to feel sad, that uh, it makes it harder to figure out endogenous depression, which is not related to that. Ways it can show up, excessive fatigue, beyond the typical amount of in FA, which is hard to figure out, needless to say. But a new change in levels of fatigue can be the onset of depression. Also associated with this, altered sleep. In particular, the most common would tend to be early morning awakening. You go to bed at a normal time, and every day you wake up at 2 a.m., not rested, and cannot fall back asleep. That is a depression pattern, which can be picked up on a sleep study. Uh, uh, and it's uh, the sleep itself is contributing, but it also is the brain itself with the depression that creates it. Lack, lack of interest. Psychologists and psychiatrists, and sometimes even me, have a fancy phrase called anhedonia, because we have to make up fancy phrases. You, you can think about the thing that you most want to do, most love in life, and you simply have no desire to do it. That is depression. Uh, feelings of hopelessness, like there is no alternative, not for a specific symptom, but lack of uh, hopelessness in general. And finally, feelings of self-destruction, uh, wanting to hurt yourself or more. These are things which are true endogenous depression beyond the things which will probably improve by simply adjustments to lifestyle, uh, adjustments to interactions, how you do things. These are things which require mental health professional intervention. And in most cases, uh, pharmacologic therapy. I'm not trying to be simply suggest that antidepressants are the cure for everything. They are not. But in when people are having this level degree of symptomatology, do not fear antidepressants. They can get one th person through the short term and allow them to approve. It is no different than neuropath in terms of uh, symptoms of neuropathic pain or stiffness or chest pain, or in some ways, ambulatory issues which are uh, uh, treated. That's the way to think about it. And do not hesitate to either call your doctor, call us, 
and to become involved with mental health prof professionals expeditiously. Uh, it's something which is commonly overlooked in every disease, uh, and we can help take care of it. So now we get to, we got 10 minutes left, 11 minutes left. Let's see if we can keep some people awake. What is all this Sky Claris and OMAV stuff? Okay, I'm going to use OMAV because it's a, the name I know. So what is the deal with Sky Claris? So it is the first approved treatment for Friedreich ataxia. What it targets is a downstream pathway of frataxin deficiency. As a result, it can improve the body's response to mitochondrial dysfunction is the way to think about it, so that uh, the same issues do not cause as much damage and allow a certain amount of repair. This particular pathway is paradoxically turned off in FA. It should be highly turned off, but for some re on, but for some reason it's turned off. Thus, it's, uh, it's not something which can be readily extrapolated to other diseases without basic science investigation. The approval is limited to people 16 and older. Why that is, is simple. The safety and dosing in people under age 16 is unclear. OMAV is very dose dependent. Now, since Riata has been uh, now purchased by Biogen, I will say one thing. The smartest thing the people at uh, Riata did was a detailed dosing study, which took all those years. This is that uh, the original data from the early phase two study. The first is people untreated. This is the outcome measure, MFARS. Uh, this is all the cohorts of all the doses better. It's actually better on OMAP. Throwing out the five milligram dose, you can, if you wanna ask about that in private, I'm happy to talk about it but each dose gets better and better until you get to 160 milligrams per day, and then all the benefit goes away. This is what you see in true biological processes. So if you don't know the do best dose is 150 milligrams, if you cut it to about 80 milligrams or 40 milligrams, you're only down basically a factor of four. That's the equivalent of going from three capsules a day to one capsule a day, basically. You cut your benefit in that study in about half or a little more. If you go high, you get rid of the benefit entirely. If you don't know the dosing, you might take the drug and have no benefit. As you talk to your doctors about this, if for some reason something thing's wrong, investigate the dose. And there, while the dose is the dose, there are ways in which the dose isn't the dose. I'll explain that in a minute. The average benefit, mild improvement, and I say Average benefit, looking across all the studies, people get a little better, maximum benefit, nine to 12 months after starting drugs. So if you now no one's within more than three months, you're in the baby steps here where people were only trivially better than placebo. The benefit emerges over time. I use the word indolent. I've been criticized for using an SAT word like that. So it creeps up on you as another way to phrase it. So after that, not sure on these slides, things stabilized for two to five years in the people we observed. Uh, that's what I would call a good benefit. In the most responsive people, a very good benefit, but it does not reach the four letter word cure. Simple enough way to look at it. Does everyone get better on OMAV? We have had about several people in the study who I am unable to convince myself they had any benefit. In one case, a person claimed no benefit, but their coworkers said that things were better. In another case, a person observed no benefit and went off of it and did much worse. So they were probably having benefit and they didn't realize because that benefit creeps up on you. And one curse, a person went off drug and nothing happened. So they probably were not having any direct benefit. So... That is an average discussion. What are the side effects and why do I have to have my lab drums when I take Sky Claris? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, this is a real drug. It is not a souped up vitamin. It is not a Debano. It is not coenzyme Q. It is a real drug. It does have some mild to modest side effects. The side effect profile I would describe as pretty clean. About 20% of people in the study had headache, nausea, and vomiting, all of which uh, tapered was largely gone by two months. I would say that observing the first three months, that's pretty much the same. Uh, I don't think it's any higher or any lower. I think that's what it is. 
The other issue, but you don't see any serious adverse events listed here because really there were not any across the study population. Now, remember, we're projecting this going out into 5,000 people, not the original 100 people. We will find new things. That's the nature of the way things go, but we haven't seen them yet, basically. Uh, remember that other things will happen in life. I will give the anecdote that a couple of weeks ago was rash week. Uh, we had four people call about rashes after starting OMAV. Uh, at most, one of them was actually related to OMAV. So other things happen in life besides FA and besides starting new drugs. That's just the way life is. Lab monitoring, it does raise levels called these things called transaminases. Those are enzymes made in every cell in the body. And in fact, OMAV raises them probably in every cell. It's just that when you look at your blood test, they come from the liver. So people call them liver function tests. This is not a liver toxicity event. It's a reactivation of the liver and all cells. There's some correlation between how much your transaminases go up and the amount of benefit, a positive correlation. BNP can go up. It's all the truth is it's all, it's all over the place. I would not put uh, they may make you have it measured, but don't get too excited about it. Cholesterol can go up uh, and uh, we can manage that. I know there's at least one person on the stage taking statins. I'm not going to poll the other two people. Uh, so, you know, cholesterol, we can manage cholesterol. We're good at that. The other thing to know, which is more important, is there are drug interactions. The prescription drugs that are most likely are a bunch of antibiotics, antifungal agents, antischistosomiasis agents, uh, Paxlovid, uh, calcium channel blockers, which we've heard to discuss and some people with heart disease get, and then a few antidepressants, although it's easily to manage around. What they do is they impede the breakdown of OMAV for the most part. So they will raise how much OMAV is in your blood for the amount of OMAV you take. As a result, you may go into that high range where it does not work. Thus, if you're on one of those medicines chronically, we decrease your dose. It's a simple thing. You get the same amount of benefit, but we just give, get it a uh, lower dose. Non-prescription things interact with OMAV. Grapefruit juice, St. John's wort, and my favorite, CBD. Uh, if you're on those, we have to adjust the dose of your OMAV as well, keeping in mind that CBD is hard to sort of quantify. So we're still trying to figure that out. These are the things that keep you out of the high range, and we do have to actually look at those things. Uh, does Skyclaris improve, next one, does Skyclaris improve the cardiac disease of FA? I think, did you write this slide or me? I forget. Uh, that's easy. There is no data, <clears throat> essentially. The people in the study have little to no cardiomyopathy. So they can't get better. They can't get worse. They're unlikely to get worse. So there were no cardiac adverse events associated with the drug. So if people were saying you shouldn't take it because you have cardiomyopathy, that has no basis in fact. If they say you should take it because it'll make your heart disease better, that has minimal basis. In fact, that ought to happen based on basic science data, but there is no proof. I think I wrote the last part. Forget about the BNP. It was transiently elevated, I would note, within the study, and I think I'm allowed to say this, and that's not going to stop me if I'm not. Uh, we would frequently have BNPs elevated. When we checked it three days later at home, it was always back to normal, so I'm not entirely sure what that means. Uh, they were never accompanied by any uh, features of heart failure. I also remind you that BNP is put out by the heart to cause you to lose salt and thus lose fluid, so it should protect you against heart failure. Think about that for a minute. Should you stop your other supplements while you take Skyclaris? Your choice. I think Skyclaris, oh, I call it Skyclaris, OMAP, should cover what those theoretically do. But I don't think there's any harm in taking them. Uh, there's no proven interaction. I leave it to an individual's discretion. Are there reasons not to take Skyclaris? Uh, uh, we won't make any jokes. Side effects that are not manageable. This is a real drug. We haven't had anyone in which the side effects have not been manageable. And we've slowly gotten people onto drug, but that there's some, there's going to be someone out there in whom we can't manage the side effect. I do not know the name of that person right now, but that's a reason not to take it to weigh the potential benefit against the potential problems, no different than any other drug. 
if there are contraindications with any other medications, uh, uh, then that can cause an issue. Uh, there is one particular drug which we may have trouble uh, navigating around. Lack of benefit. I, this is the hardest one because you will not, in most cases, feel a surge of energy the next day. It's not like a jolt of caffeine. It's something that builds up over time. So only as you retrospectively look back or try to do things that you did a year ago but couldn't do, but maybe you can do them now if you try them again, run on sentence, uh, you can discover that it's beneficial. So it's hard to really know. I would suggest a period of at least one year, probably two and perhaps three as, a per as the futility period. It simply is that hard to know in some individuals. Financial issues. I'm going to skip that in most cases. We've done a very good job, courtesy of my extremely wonderful assistant, uh, Gina Cole, in getting people on drug and getting the finances managed. That A little applause for Gina. And she's had some help from people in uh, on the company that used to be called Riotacide, which now is called Biogenside, uh, in moving forward. Uh, I've learned a lot about medical insurance. Do you want to put the barf bag in front of me? No. Uh, it's simply more complex than anyone could have imagined. Uh, so I can't, won't rule out, there won't be some cases where that occurred. And then there is the case, you know, if you don't want to take a medicine, and I've convinced that you've heard the evidence, we're not going to argue with you. Uh, I know one person who is, I know two people who have turned it down. Rationales were their rationales, they're fine. Uh, so it is everyone's choice, just like it, it's always it's always your choice to go through with these things. And I only have 33 seconds left. I remind you that almost everything in here is covered in the clinical management guidelines, which are out. And we have 39. Oh, I'm over. And I, uh, we can answer any questions if they come up and mention if you want to hear more about it. There, the Food Active News is sponsoring something coming up in a couple of weeks. I guess I'm appearing. So we, do we want to take questions or are we? Yeah, well, we'll we're running a little over, but let's maybe two or three questions. Um, I know Felicia mentioned there are a few questions that have come in from online. Um, Felicia, you want to ask one just to get us going? Um, so we have a question. Is there any treatment to prevent the progression of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Uh, yeah, to short answer is no, um, there's there's not a treatment because we actually don't fully understand the mechanisms by which people's heart get thick in FA, but there's a lot of being work, work being done on the basic science side, both to understand that, but also to treat the underlying causes of Friedrich ataxia. So hopefully as those treatments come to clinical trials and come to hopefully approval, as we treat the underlying causes, then we will see improvement in the manifestation in the heart. Questions in the room, Norm? So, natural history study, now that a good portion of us are on the side of Claris, how is that going to affect that? Because now we have an Good question. The question is, how, uh, how is the advent of Sky Claris uh, going to affect the natural history study? I think it's going to make it more important because now we have modified natural history study. Yes, we know what this modification is. Uh, everything is. All the other events in society have been helping uh, affect the modern uh, natural history over time. I will note as an example, people started using a debinone and coenzyme Q basically 25 years ago. So that modification has always been there. If you look at studies of how thick people's hearts get in the period before the advent of a debinone, they got much thicker, which makes it hard to interpret some of the studies. I didn't say changing the thickness was either a good or a bad thing, but it changes the natural history study and only by doing more of it can we come to understand it? Yeah, and that's why Thera's kind of, as I'd like to say, doubled down on natural history and really tried to push for the formation of the Global Clinical Consortium so that we can continue to collect natural history and have more sites available and be working on this globally throughout our community. A quick question in the back. Um, what's the implication of taking OMAV on participating in future clinical studies? 
So uh, while every study, so the question about OMAV and future studies, uh, it will be study dependent. The expectation, well, so you would not allow people to take OMAV if there's a drug interaction or you would have to mo mo modify your protocol. The other reason you would not be allowed to, you might not be allowed to take it is if there was a direct action, they were doing exactly the same thing. But if you don't have any of those situations, I would expect that OMAV would be allowed in those situations because they would not influence the results of the second study. There probably are other exceptions that I'm not thinking about, but for the most part, we would expect it would be allowed. They might, wouldn't want you changing doses. They might, might require you to uh, be on it for two months to begin with so that the rise in transaminases is not confounding toward the safety of the second drug. Just to put it a different way, if it becomes standard of care, then a study in general shouldn't exclude it from being part of what a person has when they're enrolled. Again, as, as long as it's not changing, um, most studies should allow for it to be part of the study. And it would not pass our IRB if it did not consider all these things. But I... I think we're still in that transition period, right? Because there are trials that were started before OMAB was approved. And so those studies will not necessarily be able to allow OMAB while those studies are still going on. And so some of this is just gonna take a little bit of time to get sorted out with the next kind of generation of clinical trial that starts in like the next year or so. Jean, last question. There's a microphone coming, hold on. Wondering what you guys think about um, the implication of the relationship between mood disorders and blood sugar swings for us. Thank you for that question. I think it was, um, what's the relationship between blood sugars and mood disorders? Well. Dave um, outlined really nicely the relationship between um, central nervous system disorders and depression. And it's true that in other forms of diabetes, there's higher prevalence of mood disorders as well, which is complicated. Some has to do with the burden of managing blood sugars for folks who have diabetes, but it's also highly plausible, right? The brain uses glucose um, and ketones as nutrients. So um, how that fuel is available to the brain would certainly be expected to affect mood and emotion. So I can certainly see, you know, there's evidence for um, a relationship to exist. So for folks who have diabetes, um, actually, it's considered one of our metrics in endocrine clinic that we should be screening everyone who has diabetes for mood disorder. Um, so bringing it up with your endocrine doctor in that setting is really important. And I would remind you that if you have any worsening of any neurological symptom in FA, uh, subacutely, the first thing we do in known diabetics is check what their diabetic control is, because it will make it, it will make any central nervous system disease acutely worse. Since those acute uh, CNS diseases don't typically change acutely, we look to the metabolic factors, which are readily treatable immediately. All right. Well. Would like to thank our panel for taking our questions um, today and every day in their clinic. <laughs>